All right. Thank you, Rod. Appreciate it, brother. It wasn't strategically planned for me to have all the verses, but, you know, I didn't write the Bible. So, but, well, it's good to see you guys today. I wish I had like an opening joke or something for you, but I don't. So, that's all right. Um, like Rod said, this morning we're going to be covering Acts chapter 7, and I did set a timer for myself. There are a lot of verses, but I think we'll actually get through them pretty quickly. In order to cover this, I want to touch on who Stephen was. Um, Rod talked about Stephen last week, but uh, Stephen was a deacon in the early church. So he was somebody that was definitely considered a leader. And let's hear what, what the Word has to say about him. It says that, um, so basically, the, the Christians, their, their elderly widows and stuff, they were not receiving some of the care and support that they, they did whenever they were under the, um, the leadership of the Jewish synagogue and all that, and, and because they were kind of being ostra, uh, ostracized at this point. And so the early church decided that uh, they needed to select specific people to actually take care of these people because they were coming to the disciples, the apostles of Jesus, and they wanted them to solve that problem, right? Because they were kind of the head, they were leading everything, and so naturally, everybody looked to them for the answers for everything, and they're like, well, we can't be doing that, and they said, like, serving tables, we can't be waiting tables and, and doing what God called us to do, so let's delegate some people, and they picked seven people. They said, let's pick seven people to be able to do this. I don't know if seven had anything to do with the number of days in a week or what, but they said, let's pick seven men to, to actually provide for these people, to help oversee the provisions for them. Now, the seven people, there were some stipulations on who those seven people were. What did they want them to be? They wanted them to be of good reputation. They had to be full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. So they had to have that, that uh, spiritual aspect about them, but they also had to be good, you know, just have wisdom, be able to be a good steward with what they had and all that stuff. That is, that is what they wanted in these, in these leaders. And it said, whom we may appoint over this business, okay? It is a ministry too, but the business of the church, like it's, it's our responsibility to take care of people, right? And so that's, that's the type of people that they called. Well, Stephen was the very first person that they listed in the selection of these people. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. The reason I'm covering this is because all of chapter 7 is about Stephen and what's going on with him at this point. So it says, um, well, first of all, the seven men, they all had Greek names, indicating that they were probably Hellenistic Jews themselves, which means that they didn't live in Jerusalem. Okay, so all these outlying areas were places where the widows were being kind of neglected, if you will. So Stephen didn't have a, a straight Jewish name. It was more of a Greek name, so he probably lived outside the appointed area right there. In Acts 6, um, 8 through 10, it says, He was full of faith and power and did great wonders and signs among the people. Then some of what was called the synagogue of the freedmen, um, they were disputing with him. They were having arguments with him. Keep in mind, Jesus was recently murdered and recently rose from the dead. And they're, they're operating this early church with the very best of their ability with the power of the Holy Spirit. And it says that he was full of faith and power and did great things, did great works. He was also elected to take care of the women, the, uh, the elderly women. And, but this is, who knows that you can actually do your job 
and you can still minister to people at the same time. You should actually still be ministering to people no matter where your job is, no matter where you go and what you're doing. That's what we're called to do is share Jesus Christ with the world. And so that's clearly what, what um, Stephen was doing whenever he got into this argument with the, uh, the synagogue leaders. It says that they secretly had men say, We've heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. They stirred up the people, the elders and the scribes, and they seized him and brought him into the council. Isn't it interesting if people can't legitimately oppose you, they will start rumors, they'll start lies, and then they're going to stir up everybody around you. That's what Satan wants to do. He wants to stir up everybody around you to get you so focused on that that you can't focus on sharing the gospel, on preaching the word of God. You're thinking that you have to defend yourself. You don't have to defend yourself. You can continue to do what, what God's called you to do. So it says that um, they, they secretly had people say, right? They didn't just come out and say it themselves. They had other people say it. And they made up lies. They stirred up lies, and, and they brought him into the council. So into the council, this council is... Probably the exact same council that crucified Jesus. They also set up false witnesses who said, This man does not cease to speak blasphemous words against the holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs which Moses delivered to us. And all who sat in the council, looking steadfastly at him, saw his face as the face of an angel. I think that's pretty awesome. But let me go back for a second. This man doesn't cease to speak these things. I would love for that to be said about me because the things that he was speaking were actually truth. They were trying to twist it, but they recognized that he was constantly speaking these things. And it says that, um, that he was speaking blasphemy against, against the holy place and the law. So he wasn't. They were taking what he was saying out of context, and that's why they drug him into this, uh, into this court council. They also mentioned Moses in this. They said that, the, um, that he was trying to change the customs that Moses brought to them. So here in a little bit, you're going to see how Stephen twists that and shows them the truth about the customs and the laws that God gave to Moses. Okay? Keep that in mind. They looked steadfastly at him and saw that his face was as the face of an angel. Not like these little paintings that we see today. Right? We see these little these paintings of angels today. They're nothing like what the Word says angels are. Okay? They're not these little um, soft and mild angels. You know? They, they, knew who the, they know who they are created by God. They know who is their ruler. But he also, if he had the face of an angel, it wouldn't have been like stern judgment and wrath. They're looking at him. They're looking at his face and they're like, it's, it's shining like an angel. But he has perfect peace and confidence because he knows and trusts his God. That's what they're talking about here. The same reflected glory that Moses had as a result of being in God's presence, if you guys remember in Exodus 34, 29, it talks about Moses' face shining and the people are like freaking out because his face is literally shining because he was in the presence of the Lord. Well, Stephen is filled with the Holy Spirit. He's speaking through the power of the Holy Spirit so much so that his face starts to shine. And here at the very end of chapter 7, you're going to see where he looks up and he, he literally says, I see Jesus standing at the right hand of God. So Jesus is looking at him, watching this. At this point in time, he's literally looking on him, and his face just starts to radiate with the power of God through him. Now, Stephen, I, I, I was describing who Stephen is, and he's widely expected as the very first martyr of the Christian faith outside of Jesus, okay? So he's... he's 
talking, and he's literally laying out the truth of Jesus, proving, proving to this court that Jesus is truly God, the Son of God, the Messiah that they've been waiting for, and they're really upset about that. But it was believed that he was approximately 28 to 32 years old at the time that he died. That's pretty young. Pretty young, especially to be walking in such power, you know, and, and we should honor our elders. We should honor and respect them, but we also can't take away from our younger people the fact that God is still God and can still move and still work in them powerfully and mightily. I don't know if mightily is an actual word. I'll have to talk to my wife about that later. But So, all of chapter 7, it sounds good. <laughs> yeah. um, all of chapter 7 is Stephen's, almost all of it, is Stephen's response to the council. He's being taken in, in front of a court that absolutely has the power to kill him and will use that power if they so choose, okay? So this whole chapter basically is the response there, and nothing that he says here is by accident. It all is one of the most powerful, um, powerful conversations ever. So this high priest is uh, Caiaphas, and he's... Like I said, he's probably the same one. It's probably Caiaphas, uh, who was the same one that had Jesus on trial in Matthew chapter 26, verse 57. He invites Stephen to explain himself. So at the, the very first um, verse here, it says, Then the high priest asked Stephen, Are these accusations true? So he gives him an opportunity to speak. Are these accusations true? What's, what I find very, very encouraging is that Stephen did not choose to defend himself. He wanted to speak the truth about Jesus in a way that people could understand. So they had been taught up to this point from the Old Testament scrolls, you know, uh, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, from the, the prophets and the law. They've been taught all these things, but it's all come through the teaching of the rabbis, from the Pharisees, the Sadducees. It's all come through that. And so sometimes um, people can take God's word and twist it to, to forward their agenda. And you see people do it with everything, not just God's word, but especially with God's word. People will make it what they want it to be so that they can have the power, the authority. Um, so that you have to go through them. If you look at, at um, a lot of the martyrs throughout history, a lot of, of Christians were murdered simply because they were trying to translate the Word of God into readable text for the people of the time so that they didn't have to rely on priests and other people to decipher the Word for them. But they were murdered, and they were usually murdered by the leaders of the church. Don't worry, I'm not going to murder you for deciphering the Word of God. <laughs> yes, he's like, oh, good, thank you. Wait. But he lays out that God came to his people and they rejected him. You're going to see that throughout this, this uh, course of, of talk here. They rejected him even before they had the temple, and they're still rejecting him now. They're trying to use anything that they can to actually be an idol. It's, it's pretty interesting. So God himself is the prize, not the temple. One of the main things that they're trying to come against Stephen with is you're speaking blasphemy against this temple. You're saying that it's going to be torn down, you know? And that's why they're wanting to, to kill him? That doesn't make any sense. They're putting this place up on a pedestal above God. But as we go through here, I want you to look at the parallels of the history that, that um, Stephen's laying out and Jesus. Because Stephen is literally using all this scripture and he's showing that Jesus is the true Messiah. 
But we'll read verses uh, 2 through 5 real quick, and then we'll kind of break it down a little bit. It says, this was Stephen's reply. Brothers and fathers, listen to me. Our glorious God appeared to our ancestor Abraham in Mesopotamia before he settled in Haran. God told him, leave your native land and your relatives and come into the land that I will show you. So Abraham left the land of the Chaldeans and lived in Haran until his father died. That's a pretty interesting part. I, I don't have time to get into it now. But Then God brought him here to the land where you now live. But God gave him no inheritance here, not even one square foot of land. God did promise him, however, that eventually the whole land would belong to Abraham and his descendants, even though he had no children yet. Even though he had no children yet. So, at the very beginning of this, he emphasizes that God of glory appeared to Abraham before he even came into the promised land. He appeared to Abraham when Abraham was a pagan. And his whole lineage, like his whole family, were pagans. Pagans mean worshipers of other gods and did horrible, horrific things. And he, he's pointing out God still came to him and still showed up when he was this person. When he was still bad, God showed up to him because God had a plan for him. I don't know. I think it's super awesome. Not only was the temple unnecessary for this revelation, the promised land itself was not necessary. See how he's laying this out? He's like, it's not about the temple. It's not about the place. God is greater than either of those and this explained how Stephen was falsely accused of speaking against the temple. It was a false accusation. It didn't hold any water. God gave him no inheritance, no children. So Abraham had no outward proof of either of these things. He could only trust God for the fulfillment of these things. He had no children. He had no inheritance. He had no land, nothing to be able to pass down. So he had to 100% completely trust God to be a man of his word, to be a God of his word. Right? Even when Abraham was in the land, he was a pilgrim. He didn't make an idol out of the blessings that God had either given him or promised him. He didn't make an idol out of it, you know? But he's talking to people that are clearly making an idol out of these things, out of the promise of God and out of the inheritance that God gave. He steps into, um, so he starts out with Abraham. Then now he's rolling into Joseph in verses 9 through 16. Sorry, I kind of uh, skipped over 6 through 9, but we've got a lot to cover. And I do recommend that you guys read all of this stuff yourself. The whole reason that, that Rod and I are, are literally breaking this down and going through chapter by chapter by chapter is because a lot of people have the Word of God. They just don't get into it. They don't study it. And I like being able to just preach on whatever I feel like God's laying on my heart. But kind of the season that we're in, we feel like that God is really putting on our hearts, lay out my Word, make it clear. Go through all of it so that people understand what's really in here. Because it's all important. He says, then the patriarchs. The patriarchs that he's talking about here are the, the 12 tribes. So they're the brothers of Joseph who create the 12 tribes of Israel. It says, the patriarchs were jealous of their brother Joseph, and they sold him to be a slave in Egypt. But God was with him and rescued him from all his troubles. And God gave him favor before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. God also gave Joseph unusual wisdom, so that Pharaoh appointed him governor over all of Egypt and put him in charge of the palace. But the famine came upon Egypt and Canaan, and there was great misery, and our ancestors ran out of food. Jacob heard, Jacob was their father, heard that there was still grain in Egypt, so he sent his sons, 
the patriarchs, our ancestors, to buy some food. The second time they went, Joseph revealed his identity to his brothers, and they were introduced to Pharaoh. Then Joseph sent for his father Jacob and all of his relatives to come to Egypt, 75 persons in all. So Jacob went to Egypt. He died there, as did our ancestors. Their bodies were taken to Shechem and buried in the tomb Abraham had bought for a certain price from Haran's sons in Shechem. So let's break that down for a quick second. Stephen here, he was emphasizing the spiritual presence of God that was with Joseph all the time. Joseph didn't need to go to the temple to be chosen by God. There was no temple, in fact. There wasn't even a temple at this point. He's pointing out people that are, are absolute pillars of their faith that, that these religious leaders are, are always basing everything on, but he's showing, look, even these people that our foundation is built on didn't even have this temple that you're trying to accuse me of talking against. God was with him all the time. Stephen's pointing that out very clearly. Now these brothers of Joseph, they were really very envious of Joseph because he was chosen by God, clearly chosen by God. So they were envious. So they sold him. They betrayed him. They turned their back on him. Jesus was also sold and betrayed. And everyone turned their back on him. See how he's laying this out for them? These, these religious leaders, they knew they had just bought Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Just as Joseph was bought. He's a picture of Jesus and that the sons of Israel, they totally rejected him. And he later became the Savior of Israel. Let's read on 17 through 22. He gets into Moses now. As the time drew near, when God would fulfill his promise to Abraham, the number of our people in Egypt greatly increased. But then a new king came to the throne of Egypt who knew nothing about Joseph. This king exploited our people and oppressed them, forcing parents to abandon their newborn babies so they would die. At that time, Moses was born, a beautiful child in God's eyes. His parents cared for him at home for three months. When they had abandoned him, Pharaoh's daughter, they, I mean, they clearly put him out in the reeds. Um, Pharaoh's daughter adopted him and raised him as her own son. Moses was taught all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and he was powerful in both speech and action. But one day... When Moses was 40 years old, he decided to visit his relatives, or his people, the people of Israel. He saw an Egyptian mistreating an Israelite, so, he, uh, so Moses came to the man, uh, to his defense, and avenged him, killing the Egyptian. Moses assumed that his fellow Israelites would realize that God had sent him to rescue them, but they didn't. The next day, he visited them again and saw two men of, of Israel fighting. He tried to be the peacemaker, tried to split them up, and he said, Men, you are brothers. Why are you fighting each other? But then the men, in the wrong, pushed Moses aside. Who made you a ruler and judge over us, he asked. Are you going to kill me as you killed that Egyptian yesterday? When Moses heard that, he fled the country and lived as a foreigner in the land of Midian. There his two sons were born. <clears throat> There's so much that correlates and parallels here. It's just absolutely incredible. So he was 40 years old, and he came. Uh, it came to his heart to visit his people. Jesus, God, it came to his heart to go visit his people. They were in a time where in Egypt, they were being oppressed. Here in Israel, where Stephen's talking to these people, they're under the Roman authority. 
who is also extremely oppressive and burdens them with heavy taxes and all this stuff. Like as he's telling them this, it's got to be blatantly obvious what's going on here. It says that the appointed time Moses came down from his royal throne out of care and concern for his people. When Moses offered deliverance to Israel, he was rejected, not just rejected, but rejected with spite. Israel denied that he had any right to be a ruler and a judge over them. Stephen's message here, it was, it was super plain. He says, you've rejected Jesus who was like Moses, yet greater than him, and you deny that Jesus had any right to be a ruler and a judge over you. Man. Look at that correlation. It just, it just jumps out. And that's why I say that Stephen, he was literally being led by the Holy Spirit as he's laying this out. He was probably taught and trained in the rules and customs just like everybody else was. But to be able to put all of this stuff together, that had to be the Holy Spirit, guys. Verses 30 through 34. This is interesting. The angel. Forty years later in the desert near Mount Sinai, an angel appeared to Moses in the flames of a burning bush. He was in, in the wilderness for 40 years. Jesus went into the wilderness for 40 days. Where the angels took care of him. When Moses saw it, he was amazed at the sight. As he went to take a closer look, the voice of the Lord called out to him, I am the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Moses shook with terror and did not dare to look. I would imagine he shook. I would probably shake too. Then the Lord said to him, Take off your sandals, for you are standing on holy ground. I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I have heard their groans and have come down to rescue them. Now go, for I am sending you back to Egypt. God tells him, I came down to go rescue them. He's letting Moses know, I am God. I came from heaven. I'm standing here speaking to you. It's me, the one true God. And Jesus, as God, came down from heaven to rescue his people. 35 through 36, it says, So God sent back the same man his people had previously rejected when they demanded, Who made you a ruler and judge over us? He sent the same guy back because he was God's chosen man. God chose him. He had a calling on his life. He said, This is what I want you to do. Have you ever had a calling? You know that you've been called to do something, yet... You find yourself out in the wilderness for 40 years. You find yourself not doing what God called you to do. Maybe that's because God's building you into the person that he wants you to be, needs you to be, before he actually accomplishes what he wants to accomplish through you. Same thing with Joseph. He was sold into slavery. He was in Potiphar's house. He was in the prison before he ever even got to the palace to actually do what God called him to do. Sometimes we have to go through those hard things, those trials, those tribulations to learn who God really is so that we can rely on Him to accomplish what He wants to accomplish in us. Through the angel who appeared to him in the burning bush, God sent Moses to be their ruler and savior. And by means of many wonders, wondrous and miracles, uh, sorry, Wonders and miraculous signs. He led them out of Egypt through the Red Sea and through the wilderness for 40 years. <clears throat> so think about that. Even though Israel rejected Moses as, as their leader, God still sent him back. He's like, they rejected me once. And he ran because he was afraid that he was going to get in trouble for killing that guy. But 
God gave him the ability to do signs and wonders, miraculous signs and wonders. Because Moses was questioning, how are they going to believe that you sent me? He says, well, tell them that I am sent you, and then I'm going to have you do all these things that there's no way you could do them by your own strength and power. You have to have been sent by me, or you couldn't do these things. No one else can. Even the few little ones that the magicians were able to do, God still overpowered them time and time again. He brought them through the Red Sea, through the wilderness for 40 years. Moses himself told the people of Israel, God will rise up, raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. I think that like me there is a clear indication of you will see the similarities between everything that I've gone through and what he's gone through. Moses was with our ancestors as the assembly of God's people in the wilderness when the angel spoke to him at Mount Sinai, and there Moses received life-giving words to pass on to us. But our ancestors refused to listen to Moses. They rejected him and wanted to return to Egypt. They wanted to return back into that same bondage, that same slavery. They told Aaron, make us some gods who can lead us, for we don't know what happened. What has become of this Moses who brought us out of Egypt? So they made an idol shaped like a calf, and they sacrificed to it and celebrated over this thing they had made. They had made. Then God turned away from them and abandoned them to serve the stars of heaven and their gods. In the book of the prophets, it is written, Was it to me you were bringing sacrifices and offering during those 40 years in the wilderness, Israel? No, you carried your pagan gods, the shrine of Moloch, and the star of your god, Rephan, and the image you had made to worship them. So I will send you into exile as far away as Babylon. Moses had promised that there would come after him a prophet, and he warned that Israel should take special care to listen to him. They want to stand on all these laws and everything that Moses said, yet they don't want to stand on this thing that Moses said. They want to pick and choose from him what they want to listen to. And Stephen brought out the one point that they never wanted to talk about. They made a calf in those days and rejoiced in the works of their own hands. One accusation against Stephen was that he blasphemed the temple. It wasn't that Stephen spoke against the temple, but against the way that Israel worshipped the temple of God instead of the God of the temple. That's why they were mad. When ancient Israel rejected Moses and God's work through him, they replaced him with their own man-made religion. That's exactly what these guys were doing. They were replacing God with all of the religious activities and the things that go along with it. They were worshiping those things instead of worshiping the true God. 42 through 43. I already read that. It says, Our fathers had the tabernacle. Solomon built him a house. Remember whenever King David wanted to build the house? Wanted to build the the tabernacle and God said, no, you can't. You're a man of of warfare, of bloodshed. You killed too many people. It's going to take somebody different than you, bro. Stephen's point was that the presence of the tabernacle or the tabernacle itself didn't keep them from rejecting God and his special messengers. He confronted their idolatry of the temple. In doing so, they tried to confine God within the temple. Within the temple. (laughs) They're like, this temple 
is the only place God is. That's why he's laying it out that God met with them. Everywhere. They don't need to be in that temple. Even Jesus himself said, there's going to come a time where you won't worship me here or there. Talking to the woman at the well, she's like, "Is it? should we worship here or should we worship there? He's like, there's going to come a time where my people are going to worship me everywhere. But these guys are trying to keep that place. They're trying to keep that place, and it forces people to come to them instead of them being the light of the world. A lot of Christians today do the same thing. It might not be in worshiping the building. It might not be worshiping this place. But they do the same thing. The only place that they meet with God is at church. The only time that they meet with Him is on Sunday mornings whenever they come here. Guys, that's not enough. That's not, that's not enough. As far as these people are concerned, God is absent from the rest of their lives. So they'll go about their business and they want their business to be their business until they come to meet with God. Not realizing that He doesn't leave us. He doesn't forsake us. He's always there. He always sees us. He always knows what we're doing, where we're doing it, when we're doing it. It doesn't matter how high you go, He's there. It doesn't matter how deep you go, He's there. He's as far as the east is from the west. You cannot get away from Him. But we... We want our own little lives and our own desires to be ours. Our little selfish things, you know what I mean? The things that we want that we kind of don't necessarily want him to see. So we, we act like he's not there until we come in here. And then we're holier than holy, right? I mean, it's just, <laughs> we put on this show, you know, it's like, hey, no, seriously, I'm always like this. I don't think that pleases God. Acts 7, 51 through 53. Stephen. Uh, Stephen had to know what he was getting himself into here. <clears throat> Stephen goes on and he says, You stubborn people, basically you stiff-necked people, you are heathen at the heart and deaf to the truth. Must you forever resist the Holy Spirit? That's what your ancestors did, and so do you. Name one prophet your ancestors didn't persecute. They even killed the ones who predicted the coming of the righteous one, the Messiah, whom you betrayed and murdered. You deliberately disobeyed God's law, even though you received it from the hands of angels. So, Stephen's drawing on the Old Testament concepts here. And he rebukes them who rebuked Jesus. He's calling them stiff-necked, right? Most of your translations probably say stiff-necked and uncircumcised hearts and stuff. So, like, he probably got this from uh, Deuteronomy 10, verse 16. It says, Therefore circumcise the foreskin of your heart and be stiff-necked no longer. Cut off the things that aren't necessary. Stop being so rigid in everything and understand that what God wants is to love Him and to love others. That's what's more important than anything else. And He's telling them the truth. But guys, sometimes we have to tell the truth. And that truth may get us in big trouble. But sometimes we hold back and we don't tell the truth because we're afraid of getting in trouble. I want us all to take a page out of, out of uh, Stephen's conversation here and for all of us to walk with a clear understanding that God is who He says He is. He's going to protect us until He takes us home. Almost 20 times in the Old Testament, God calls Israel stiff-necked. These religious leaders were acting just like their forefathers were, but they didn't want to hear it. 
Israel prided itself on the sign of circumcision because it separated them from the Gentiles. And that's why Stephen was hitting that, that point here. They're so proud about doing these outward appearance things, and their hearts are still disgusting. They're not living the life that God wants them to live, that God's called them to live. They're not being the leaders God called them to be. He essentially, he essentially told them that you're just like the Gentiles in your rejection of the Lord. You know that had to make them very, very angry. <laughs> this was obviously very offensive to them, but his message was true. God is no respecter of places. The temple was a wonderful gift from God, but it was wrong to overemphasize it as the house of God. Israel was guilty of what they had often been guilty of, rejecting God's messengers. That's exactly what they were doing here. God used Stephen's martyrdom to send the church out into the entire world. So at this point, God had already given them the instruction to go into all nations, proclaiming the good news, the kingdom, you know, making disciples, all these things. But nobody had really gone yet because the heat hadn't been turned up. And it's getting turned up. The whole idea behind this permanent stationary temple is you come to me, and so that's what they were thinking. Everybody should come here, and people did. You know, they, they, they go to Jerusalem, they, they go to the temple, they make this trip. Um, but what God is showing here is the church shows a different heart of God. He shows that you don't have to come here. I will go to you. I will come to you. That's what we as a church are supposed to be representing right now. And that's what is, is happening through this. So in 754, um, it kind of lays out the council's reaction. It says the Jewish leaders were infuriated by Stephen's accusations, and they shook their fist at him in rage. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed steadily into heaven and saw the glory of God, and he saw Jesus standing in the place of honor at God's right hand. And he told them, he says, he says this, he literally tells them, he says, look, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing in the place of honor at God's right hand. I think he's exclaiming this like, look, can you see this too? Are you seeing this? Do you see what I see? It's Jesus. He's standing at God's right hand. I know you know what he looks like because you just killed him. He didn't. I, I put that part in there. It's actually not in the book. They put their hands over their ears like little children, na, 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 and began shouting. They rushed at him and dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. His accusers took off their coats and laid them at the feet of a young man named Saul. As they stoned him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He knows he's going to die. It says he fell to his knees shouting. He didn't say it quietly. He shouted, Lord, don't charge them with this sin. And with that, he died. Stephen's message hit the target. They couldn't dismiss or ignore anything that he had just said. I don't know that they wanted to either. They should have. They reacted with rage instead of submission to the Holy Spirit. So they're acting like children. These are supposed to be the leaders of the most prestigious organization in the whole world. They wanted all this, this honor and this praise. They walked around like they were these great people. Yet when they get pressure and somebody opposes them, they start acting like children. Because they don't have that foundation, that true foundation. They're not being led by the Holy Spirit. They don't have His grace, His mercy, His love. They aren't producing the, the fruits of the Spirit. Clearly they're not. They gnashed their teeth at him. They gnashed their teeth at him. I think that that's a, a phrase that we really need to pick up on, okay? Because 
seven different times Jesus describes hell as a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. And they gnashed their teeth at him. You can find the, uh, that main one in Matthew 8, verse 12, if you want. They gnashed their teeth at him. They were acting more like the residents of hell than they were like the godly leaders they were supposed to be. We have to check ourselves and make sure that whenever people are opposing us, that we're acting like the residents of heaven and not like these guys were. We have to act like how Jesus acted. We've got to respond to people the way Jesus responded because the Word says that it's His kindness that leads us to repentance. And what, what Stephen's trying to do here is get them to see the truth. And later you will find that many of the priests actually started to believe and started to follow Christ and live as Christ's followers. Some of the people in this very room did this same thing, okay? Stephen's vision here. I think that it's significant to note that he's standing, that he's standing at the right hand of God. This is important. Please pick up on this. Because most of the descriptions in the words literally talks about him sitting in heaven at the right hand of God. But at this point, he's standing. Keep in mind in Matthew 10, verse 32, Jesus said, Therefore, whoever confesses me before men... Him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. So what do you think he's doing here? As he stands up and Stephen is confessing Jesus before men, Jesus is standing up and confessing him before the Father. I pray that, that, that he does that for me one day. And I pray that when the time comes that I'll be just like Stephen and willing to say what has to be said regardless of the circumstances, regardless of the outcome, knowing that it might not be good. I pray that God gives me the power of the Holy Spirit to be able to do that, and I pray that that my heart is so full of love for him that there's no way that I couldn't do it. <clears throat> it says that they ran at him. These guys, they were so angry that they ran at him. This, the same word... I thought this was super interesting. The same uh, word in the ancient Greek is hormeo. And this same word is used to describe the mad rush of the herd of pigs, the swine, that rushed into the sea in Mark 5, 13. It was an out-of-control mob rushing at Stephen. When the demons entered into those, those pigs, and they all rushed down the hill. It was just an out-of-control mob. And that it's the same word used to describe them rushing after Stephen to kill him. Stephen's last words, though, were absolutely um, amazing. They were profound. His life ended in the same way it had been lived, in complete trust in God, believing that Jesus would take care of him in life and the life to come. He was acting out of absolute pure faith that Jesus was going to take care of him. And then he says, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. He shows that it's a sin. He's, he's voicing that it's a sin. It's clearly a sin what they're doing because he just laid out the facts that what he was saying wasn't blasphemy. So they're murdering him. 
What they're doing is murder. It's not putting him to death for legal reason. He says, Lord, don't charge them with this sin. And God, if you think about it, God answered Stephen's prayer because the people that he was talking about, he says, don't hold this against them. Don't charge them with this. We know that some of them did come to a knowledge and a relationship with Jesus. And one of those people just happens to be Saul of Tarsus, who later becomes Paul, who wrote over a third of the New Testament. But, I also want to add something here. Paul didn't get away with it scot-free. Like, it wasn't that his actions didn't go unpunished. Because when Jesus was talking to Ananias, he said, go do this. Go you know, heal him and tell him about me and stuff. And I will show him how much he has to suffer for my name's sake. Paul had a really rough life. And he was standing there allowing them to murder uh, Stephen. So much so that... Um, Some people, some people read this, the very next, what Rod's getting ready to cover here next week probably. They read this and they think, well, this shows that Saul of Tarsus was really young and he was just a young child at this point. No, no, no. That, the way that that's worded, people twist it. it he was young. The, the term means he was in his prime. And you will see later on in Acts that it says that, he says, I, Paul, casted my vote against Stephen to have him murdered. He says, I cast my vote. If he cast his vote, that means that he had to be part of the leadership in the synagogue at that time. So he wasn't just some kid that just happened to watch this and then all of a sudden, you know, decided to become a murderer, you know, a Christian murderer later. He literally cast his vote for this. But Stephen, he literally prayed the same prayer that Jesus prayed basically on the cross. As Jesus is being crucified on the cross, he looks down and says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Probably some of the very, literally the same people that are stoning Stephen to death, Jesus was looking at saying the very same thing to them. And this is repetition for them. They're seeing this. Guys, no greater love has anybody than somebody that will lay their life down. For someone else. This may seem really rough. It may seem really rough. But Jesus uses all things. God uses all things for the good of those who love him. Even the hard things that we go through sometimes can be used for the good of other people who love him. And can be used for our good too. Don't despise it. Don't despise it. Just seek God's face on what he's trying to do with it and through it. I like that he proclaimed it loudly and publicly. He wasn't whispering under his breath. He just loudly, loudly asked God to forgive them. Super powerful. Super powerful. All right. That concludes chapter 7. Next week we'll jump into chapter 8. Let's see, Rod should have... Oh, yeah, Rod, you got, you got 40 verses next week, Rod. <laughs> 40. All right. Let's pray. Mm. Heavenly Father, we love you so much, and we thank you, God, for laying out your word, your truth, your passion, and your heart for us through your word, God. Thank you for your servants like uh, Stephen here, Lord, and your other apostles, your other disciples that, that had to ultimately suffer death. And God, today we just ask, Holy Spirit, what is it that you're trying to say to us through this message today? Lord, burden our hearts with what it is that you want for us through this message, Lord. I pray that we will leave here changed, not the same as we came in, God. 
but with a new vision and a new passion and a new purpose, a new drive in our hearts to be who you've called us to be and to love you, Lord, passionately, regardless of the circumstances, God. Holy Spirit, Lord, please lead us and guide us and direct us. Give us the boldness to be the world changers that you've called us to be, God. And we're looking forward to seeing you soon, Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.